The primary election is coming fast. We look at the candidates for mayor of San Diego and for city council districts one and seven. And we ask what this election means for the city and its ability to solve its big problems. So grab your sample ballot and join us because the KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer, and joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today, KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen, investigative reporter Claire Tregesser of KPBS, and columnist Michael Smolens of the San Diego Union Tribune. Well, before we consider who wants to be San Diego's new mayor, let's look at the man vacating the office. Kevin Faulkner was a veteran councilman when fortune smiled in the form of Bob Filner. A scandal forced Democrat Filner from office in 2013. Faulkner won a special election, coasted to re-election, and is termed out this year. A lot has happened on his watch. And uh, Michael, it's not over yet. Uh, we got more to come this year. Tell us about the proposed initiative, the mayor's backing the big convention center deja vu all over again. Well, it is, and it's the, the rock he's been pushing up the hill since even before he was on the council. He supported expansion of the convention center and the various iterations. Now, of course, that this hotel tax increase would not only fund the expansion, but homelessness services and, or services for the homeless and road repairs. Uh, it's a, still a tough climb. It's a two-thirds vote majority, and in San Diego, some people think that's just impossible to get under the best circumstances. They do have a pretty broad coalition on this, so there, there's you know a, a, probably a better chance than before. The question is, how much is this tied to his legacy? I mean, it sort of has defined him uh, as you know maybe the the charges leaving and, and so forth. So. If this goes down, is that, you know, sort of suggest a, a failed administration? Uh, but there's a lot else that he's done, and uh, it's been cyclical, as we know. Yeah, you mentioned the charges. Uh, he, quote, lost the charges, talked a lot about this show, on the show about that. Uh, but maybe that was a blessing in disguise and didn't fund the new state. Yeah, I don't know how much that really hurt exactly. him. Uh, you know, I mean, given how the ill will towards the chargers, I think most people felt like, they wanted to leave regardless of what And if we'd hook, um, hooked the taxpayers into hundreds of millions on that deal, maybe that would have been, you know, the, the worst thing could have happened. But on homelessness, uh, Falker took a big hit in 2017, the hepatitis outbreak. Several people died. That was a nasty uh, situation. Well, 20 people. And like 600 were sickened by the, the disease. And you know, I'm assuming most of those were hospitalized. So, yeah, that was a real dark time. I mean, it's very interesting because before then, Faulkner was sort of this, this new rising star in the Republican Party. He was getting a statewide attention and uh, building a statewide platform. Then that all hit, and he really sort of had to retrench because you got to take care of what's going on at home. Things have improved on the homeless front. People aren't dying in the streets, at least at that level. And you know now, as we've seen, he's sort of rebuilding the statewide platform, uh, potentially to run for governor in 2022. And uh, the city uh, uh, on the homelessness front, they've they've opened some more shelters. The numbers actually got a little better in the in the county overall. Yeah, the, well, the the count, as we know, is it's apples and oranges. They changed the methodology. But the reality of it is that, that regardless of methodology, that if there was a huge increase like there was in San Francisco, L.A., and other areas in uh, California. We would have seen it here. So something's happening in a positive direction there. There's always a flip side. Uh, there was a, a report uh, some time ago that showed people that actually were homeless and got into permanent housing were falling back into homelessness at a larger rate or a greater rate than in other cities. So, you know, the record is definitely going to be mixed, and they just haven't had the uh, ability to get the permanent housing and people into them to the degree that they need to. Yeah, I mean, do you think that he will, if he did run for governor or even just leaving office, would he be able to count handling homelessness as a win? Well, it's interesting, Claire, because that's sort of the direction they're going. Uh, he, he's uh, getting a, you know, committee together to shape an initiative to uh, re really repeal or pull back certain criminal laws that he says allowed people not to go to jail, to get criminals out of jail earlier, and a lot of those are homeless. There's a big debate over how much is real there, but that's the direction he's going in. So, yeah, he's going to run on homelessness uh, to a degree, and, you know, the picture does look worse elsewhere right now, but that history is not long in the past, and that's going to come up. And as bad as things might be in San Francisco and L.A., 
they haven't had an epidemic tied to homelessness like we've had. And I think what, maybe one of the challenges that Faulkner has faced in his time here is just defining his own brand of Republican, because uh, the Republican brand in San Diego has really suffered under pre President Trump, and he's really tried to carve his own path, um, you know, taking on homelessness, taking on housing affordability and housing production. Um, but this, this uh, effort to kind of take a law and order approach to homelessness, change the criminal justice reforms that passed um, you know, with the approval of voters across California seems to be an interesting uh, take that I, I don't know how, how it'll play statewide because people are certainly upset about homelessness, um, but I'm, I'm not sure that, that, that uh, you know, a majority of Californians see that approach of, of using the police and, and using criminal justice laws and everything to, to solve it or to manage that crisis. Right, and that's the next thing, it seems, for Faulkner, as you're saying, right? Well, that, you know, I mean, who knows? I, I wouldn't bet the House that he's going to run for governor, but certainly at least not yet, but uh, they're certainly building in that direction for that potential. And that would be that whole law and order yeah, thing mean, is the, the platform. The Republican Party in California has, you know, crashed and burned over the years, and they're just looking for some way to, to get back in the game. There's a whole, you know, effort to try to focus on quality of life issues and get away from the more polarizing things, get away from Donald Trump. I mean, my personal view is that, you know, if Trump wins re-election, that's a real problem for Faulkner running in 2022. Not that he's tied with Trump, but that's just you know going to dominate. Well, he's talked about building bridges, not walls. Mm -hmm. He really has pulled it away from him. Andrew, I wanted to ask you about uh, the, uh, the the council. I mean, a lot of people said super majority of Democrats, Falker won't be able to w work uh, with this council. He's a lame duck and all. How's it really worked out? Yeah. Well, I think that. Um the six votes, uh, the six Democratic uh, votes on the city council has played out in a couple different ways. They have they have achieved a couple of policy goals that they um, had to start with, one of them being the change to the city's inclusionary housing proposal uh, that requires developers to sh shoulder a, a greater burden of um, building affordable housing. Um, that passed with ultimately a, a compromise uh, you know, version of that passed with the support of Faulkner. But I think that the fact that they were able to pass anything from the start is a reflection of their kind of greater strength having those six votes and the threat of a veto over, uh, of overriding his veto. And then the second big accomplishment from the Democrats is the affordable housing bond that's likely to be on the November ballot. That also needed six votes, and it got exactly that many from uh, only the Democrats on the council. All right. Well, we'll talk more about that as we get a little closer to the election, but we're going to move on to some, some other local stuff here today, which, since we're focusing on local and not what's going on in Washington. I understand there's a trial. Uh, Republicans' almost exclusive hold on the San Diego's mayor's office could end in November. In fact, it's possible the candidates squaring off in the general election could both be Democrats. And Andrew, uh, explain uh, for us here uh, why the Democrats have a significant edge in the battle to replace Mayor Faulkner. Well, they're the largest share of registered voters in the city. There are more than twice as many uh, Democratic voters in, in the city as Republicans. Big uh, change from the old days. Certainly, yeah. And, and uh, you know, that's a trend that we've seen across California, certainly. Um, there's a change since 2016 when Faulkner was able to win in the primary election. And in primaries, the, the voter turnout uh, leans more conservative. So this time, since we know there's going to be a November runoff regardless, I think that's attracted a more um, competitive field of candidates. Um, the, as we mentioned, the Republican brand has really suffered under President Trump. And so um, that certainly played out here in San Diego. We saw that um, in a city council race play out an incumbent Republican losing, um, in, at least in part because of these uh, uh, attacks associating her with President Trump. And, um, you know, we've seen the candidates um, with the most campaigning under their belt are the Democrats. We had a Republican enter the race really only at the last minute. Yeah, well, let's get into some of these uh, these folks there. Best known is probably uh, Todd uh, Gloria. Start with him. Yeah, so uh, Todd Gloria first elected to the San Diego City Council in 2008, easily reelected in 2012. Um, he uh, served as the city's interim mayor for six months. After, a little on-the-job training. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, after the resignation of Bob Filner, because um, he was council president at the time. Um, in that time, he really championed some progressive uh, changes at the city, raising the city's minimum wage, um, which ultimately made it all the way to a, a voter um, referendum. Um, but he kind of saw that through to victory. Um, he also revived the city's languishing climate action plan. That's part of his legacy, certainly. Um, he he uh, was elected to the state assembly in 2016. He became majority whip there, um, so a leadership role at the state. Um, he says he's really proud to have passed legislation protecting the LGBTQ community. He would be the first openly gay elected mayor of San Diego. 
Um, and he's won a really broad coalition of, of uh, support from the County Democratic Party, from the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce, and the um, Labor Council. Uh, so certainly uh, support um, from across the political spectrum. And then uh, Barbara Bree doesn't have as long a political tenure. Tell us about her. Yeah, so she had a career in journalism uh, sh and uh, entrepreneurship. She founded some big companies. Uh, she's got a Harvard MBA, so she says kind of her, her brand is the outsider, not a career politician, but somebody who's um, been successful on the business uh, side of things. Um, she founded some organizations to promote uh, women leadership. Uh, elected to the city council in 2016. It was a big um, battle at that time. Republicans were hoping to uh, retake that uh, District 1 seat. Up in the La Jolla area in the North Yeah, city, no. and so, um, you know, she um, almost got a simple, uh, complete majority in the primary election, which was really a, a testament to voters, you know, preferring her over the Republican candidate there. Um, she's uh, the chair of the budget committee on the council, so that's been one issue that she's um, worked on a lot. She's uh, taken up short-term rentals although and she did get the council to pass um, some regulations for short-term home rentals but um, Airbnb and the that industry um, gathered signatures and got the council to end up rescinding it so it's not really a, a legislative win on her part there although she she continues to talk about it and and try to kind of use that as as her p campaign platform uh, ongoing problem all right we're gonna we're gonna hear from these folks now here we got Todd Gloria first talking on how to address homelessness and then Barbara Bree with a different emphasis same problem I recognize that there are a lot of people who are suffering and they want a mayor who sees, hears them, is going to act on their behalf, but importantly who's going to go out and explain to other people that this is not bad for you. This can actually help make your community better. This can make your quality of life better. If we're going to effectively address homelessness, we have to acknowledge that a lot of the increase in homelessness is due to mental health and substance abuse issues, which is a county issue which the county has neglected for decades and is finally starting to address. All right, Claire, so the, the battle, it seems, is between uh, the, those two main ones. Tell us about the other folks uh, well, are running. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, I, I, I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah, no, it, I, it I, seemed I, like that, that was the battle until someone else jumped into until the race. Until a Republican race, jumped right, in. Which is Republican Scott Sherman, right. who's been on the city council. He's now termed out. This is the end of his term. And year. the reason being, if you see an R next to the name, uh, the other two will splinter the Democratic vote. And yeah, I mean, they've got some, some polls out, which, you know, it's you never know, really know with polls, but they're saying that um, Scott Sherman has the, the advantage over Barbara Bree so that it might be Todd Gloria and Scott Sherman um, in the in the general election. And so, as you say, a veteran councilman, some name recognition. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he's I think he's made a name for himself on the city council working on housing and um, he's kind of bringing you know more of a local conservative voice to 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 the race he's talking about bike lanes are stupid and <laughs> uh, we should you know we should be spending money on roads not bike lanes um, and bringing also that that we need to do more on the enforcement less on the compassion side on homelessness which is an argument that other Republicans are making as well. And another uh, candidate, not terribly well known, Tasha Williamson. Right. So she is a local activist, really well known from um, leading protests in the community, especially after uh, Earl McNeil died in National City Police custody. Um, and so she said that she didn't feel like there was anyone who looked like her in the race and anyone who was really representing or cared about uh, Southeast San Diego. So she decided to jump in. And so she's bringing that voice to the race. All right, and we, speaking of voices, nice segue here. <laughs> We've got Tasha Williamson on what she represents and then Scott Sherman on the lack of middle market housing. I'm bringing a whole new tone um, to to this uh, political landscape in that um, I'm doing things that have never been done before. Uh, but the one thing that I'm going to be saying that we're going to be doing is giving back to the people. You have people in, in subsidized housing. They start doing better and moving their way up, up the economic ladder. And there's no place for them to go because they can't go from $700 a month to $2,000 a month. All right, uh, and as we mentioned, uh, because of the, the Republican dynamic there, uh, Sherman has a, a pretty good shot now. Yeah, I mean, if you think, you know, I think there's about 25% Republicans in the city, but if all of them vote for the Republican candidate, plus he gets some no party preference, he, he should be in a good position to advance. And then what happens now uh, as we get on to the, the general, Michael? Well, it's interesting because uh, Scott Sherman just changed the dynamics of the race entirely almost because it was 
Bree and Gloria for what a, a year? How long have they been running? Two Democrats. He gets in, correct? Uh, he gets in uh, in December, just before the filing deadline, and now really it's it's a race between Sherman and Bree for the second spot. The polls show, and I agree with Clary, polls are polls, but. Uh, all of them show Todd Gloria far enough ahead that he should, unless some lightning strikes, get into the November election. Barbara Bree's not a certain thing. Uh, she may, she will have more resources, I think, than, than Scott Sherman. But, I mean, it's amazing. Sh Sherman got in and, and immediately he was competing with her or even ahead of her without really doing much. He's a straight shooter. Uh, he is conservative, but more of a businessman conservative. And he's got uh, kind of a pretty good sense of humor. So we'll see how that transpires. Um, I think, like I said, in the, the last several weeks of the election, we're going to see the Bree campaign more retool. She's been kind of, you know, focusing on Gloria. Is that the wise strategy? And they got smart people on that campaign, and they need to get through to November, and that's targeting Sherman, I think. Well, the breaking Clark. news from my interview with Scott Sherman was he's always said, oh, I'm not a politician. I just got into this because people asked me to. <clears throat> and then he said, okay, I guess I am a politician now. I've, I've been in it seven years and I'm running for mayor, so. Funny you should say that because Barbara Bree also has these yard signs out that says, Barbara Bree, not a politician. I asked her about that in the interview and she said, well, I'm not a career politician. Well, so. one thing, win, lose, or draw for Scott Sherman, what he does do is he gives a legitimate Republican candidate. I mean, it looked like there wasn't gonna be right. one, which in, if you look at the history of San Diego would be phenomenal, whether he wins in the primary or you know if he gets to the November election, that gives a platform for him and some Republican-themed ideas, whether he wins or not, at least that they've got you know, a, a legitimate candidate in the fall election happens. if that happens. All right, well, let's move on and turn to some key council races. Um, we're going to get deeper into the main issues and challenges facing the new mayor and council, but let's start with District 1, the race to replace Barbara Bree and Andrew, start with you. Tell us where that place is. Yeah, the so the, it's the city's north coastal neighborhoods, La Jolla, University City, Carmel Valley, Torrey Pines, a lot of um, high paying uh, biotech jobs in the life sciences industry, um, UCSD, of course, and it's one of the wealthier districts, much uh, more expensive than the rest of the city. And who's running uh, up the, in District 1? We've got, it's the most crowded race that will be on the, the city's ballot uh, in March. Uh, so there will be eight candidates. I spoke with the four candidates who had actually raised money as of the last um, filing deadline, the disclosure deadline uh, and the end of um, summer last year. So um, we've got uh, Joe, uh, Joe LaCava. He's a um, local, he's a, a civil engineer by trade, but he's a local activist and consultant on a lot of different Been issues. Been on the planning board up there a long time. Yeah. And, well, and he uh, ran against Barbara Bree, but then he, dropped he, out. Yeah, so he, he has uh, run for uh, elected office before, although he didn't uh, actually compete in the election itself. He wasn't on the ballot then. Um, uh, there's uh, Will Moore. He's a small business attorney. Also, um, so had some uh, has you know been active on uh, some civic issues. Um, Aaron Brennan, a retired city firefighter and Navy reservist, and um, the fourth candidate I spoke with was Harid Puentes. He goes by H, um, and he is a management consultant and also founded a nonprofit in San Diego that is uh, provides a startup accelerator um, services to uh, minority entrepreneurs. And we were talking before we came on the air, you've got a, a wide open race here, not a, a ton of, of big names. On, and how do you handicap this race? Well, you know, we use the term small bore. You, how do you handicap it? You know, you should be careful about handicapping, yeah. I think. But, you know, the usual, uh, you know, yardsticks apply, money raised and, and what kind of organization they have. And, you know, trying to get a sense for what kind of support they have in the community, how many people they have knocking on doors. Uh, you don't see a lot of television ads and city council campaigns like this and so forth. But, you know, you mentioned wide open. One point that, uh, sort of an overview of all this, there's five city council seats that are open in this election. That means, which it never happens, but because people are running for other office, so a majority of the council will be new. Mm -hmm. The remaining council members have only been in office for two years. So you've got that tremendous turnover. You're going to have a new mayor. Granted, unless Tasha wins, uh, it's going to be somebody familiar with City Hall. But th that combined with sort of an exodus of longtime city staffers with institutional memories, 
the city's going to be in a really peculiar position, and to see how that all plays out is really going to be that's something. That's an excellent that, point. Yeah. Well, I think that that's, that's just going to mean that whoever ends up winning the mayor's race is going to be in a real position of strength to do what they want at the city, um, you know, uh, managing to um, get some more council members on their side. Um, you know, if, if, if the person who wins has a really clear policy agenda, they could uh, co accomplish quite a bit, I think. Might one of those candidates, maybe Joe Lacava, as you said, have a, a little edge with, with name? Oh gosh, you know I, I don't place bets on city council <laughs> races. Um, you know I think that he's he's got uh, a quite a bit of political experience. He's been you know involved in a lot of um, issues around the city. He's spoken to a lot of the issues that are important to District One voters, like short-term rentals. He was really active on that issue. Mm -hmm. um, so you know I, I but again, Will Moore has been I, around too. I mean it's it's really hard to know. And, has the Democratic Party endorsed in that race? Or uh, no? no, they've the the four that I interviewed are the ones they've rated acceptable. Um, but we just found out um, recently that Wilmore was inter um, endorsed by the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe that'll uh, give him some edge if they form, you know, decide to give him a lot of money for that. See what see what endorsements might mean. Well, Claire, tell us about a distinctly different San Diego sure. uh, Council <laughs> District. That's seven, maybe one of the most diverse districts uh, in the city. Where is it and who lives there? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's not diverse like that there's a majority of minority people in it, but it's but communities like Linda right. Vista. Stretches and, from Linda yeah. Vista, Mission Valley, Allied Gardens, and then up to Tierra Santa and Del Cerro. So it kind of covers a, a range of, of communities. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, Asian representation in Linda Vista. That's been a very interesting community since it was developed during uh, World War II. Uh, so who's uh, uh, running uh, there? Uh, we've got, um, uh, as, I, as you say, a broad uh, you know area and a, a right. broad different number of communities. But Scott Sherman, we mentioned earlier, is, is termed out. Um, okay, we've got Noli Zosa who's mm -hmm. running. He's the uh, Republican candidate. And then there are three Democrats, Raul Campillo, Wendy Wheatcroft, and Monty McIntyre. Okay, so we have uh, a Republican. We should note that this is nominally a nonpartisan, these races for mayor and city hall, nominally nonpartisan, but. Right, but not yeah, reality. Or party politics always, <laughs> plays. always, it matters. always comes in in American yeah. uh, democracy, doesn't it? Well, so uh, the Republican likely to replace, but the, I mean the numbers. You got three Democrats. Well, and now there's a majority of Democratic voters in the district, so you know it's it's we'll have to see. It seems probably likely that the Republican has a good shot of making it past the March election, and so then it's the three Democrats are kind of duking it out to see who will compete against him for November. All right, now we do have uh, some voices from uh, from these folks here, and they're gonna come one after another. I think we're starting with uh, Noli Zoza, and then I'll have you introduce the rest of them. Let's hear that. There's mental issues, there's substance abuse issues, there's alcohol-related issues, there's relationship issues. There's so many different reasons why people are homeless. Um, and to have a one, uh, you know, offer one solution is, is, is not going to is not going to solve the uh, solve the problem. Georgette Gomez said we're going to have a compromise plan on an inclusionary rate for uh, housing costs. So when a new project comes up, uh, the developer has to set aside a percentage to keep the either the rent or the housing uh, cost, the purchase cost lower. We have to try to make our decision making process better. We really have to use a critical analysis process. So you have to first get all the facts. Then you have to figure out if there are any best practices anybody's developed. And uh, who did we hear from there? Uh, okay, we were missing someone there, but right. um, so that was Noli Zosa starting out and then Raul Campillo, uh, Monty McIntyre, and Wendy Wheatcroft as okay. well. Okay, so uh, they touched on some of the issues here, but of course the chronic issues in the city, it's homelessness, it's affordable housing, it's uh, a lot of the uh, the issues that, that we talk about all the time and that the mayor's facing, of course. Right, well, and I asked each of them, you know, what is your number one issue? And all of them had housing and homelessness up there, and so that was them kind of talking about what they would do. Noli Zosa also had this kind of common Republican talking point now, it seems, of you know, we can't just do housing first, we need to do other things to address the problem. And then Raul Campillo was saying that, that he favored the inclusionary housing rate that was passed by Georgette Gomez and the city council. Um, and Monty McIntyre was talking, his issue was actually more about city hall culture and, uh, and changing that. Michael? Well, you know, we often look through, even though the city council races and the local races are technically nonpartisan, we say party politics plays a big role, but I think sometimes we, and I'm guilty as anybody, 
overdo the partisan aspect of it. A lot of these things are, you know, municipal issues, and sometimes the coalitions on the council change depending on the issue. I mean, you know, we all talked about the supermajority and will Faulkner have problems? Maybe a little bit, but actually, the one veto was not that he had in his entire, uh, you know, tenure so far was not overridden because he was able to to get a vote, uh, one of the Democrats to side with him. He's worked actually pretty well with some of the more liberal members of the council, and not so much with some of the moderates. He and Barbara Bree are sort of on the outs, and Scott Sherman and he haven't been in sync lately. Uh, so, I mean, that dynamic is there, the partisan dynamic. But sometimes, given the the issues of homelessness, roads, and things like that, things shift. All right, we're going to give you the last word there, and there's plenty more to come here. I should tell uh, listeners and viewers that we've got uh, weeks of this lined up here because the big California Super Tuesday primary is coming up early in March. But that does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. And I'd like to thank my guests, Andrew Bowen and Claire Tregesser of KPBS News and Michael Smolens of the San Diego Union Tribune. And for complete information on the races, candidates, and issues on the March ballot, check out our election coverage at kpbs.org. And before we close today, a word on the passing of Jim Lair, longtime anchor of the PBS NewsHour. I had the pleasure of interviewing him for a newspaper profile during the 1996 Republican National Convention in July and a little later at the presidential debate here at the University of San Diego. He was a giant in our profession. His exceptional experience, unquestioned integrity, and steady hand are sorely missed these days. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable.